Okay, thank you, thank you. Xie Xie. Um, so, uh, can we have the, uh, yes, the next slide. So, uh, what I want to do before uh, lunch is just take you through a series of slides on uh, strategic marketing management. So, now, now we are talking a little bit more uh, serious technical stuff related to uh, marketing. And then after lunch, we will have a, a lecture on marketing in a slowdown because, you know, the way in which your tech marketing has to change when you have less economic growth, you have more competition, more of a slowdown, different type of marketing is required under those circumstances. But first of all, I want to give you some overview on uh, strategic marketing, and uh, I will go through this quite quickly. Now, let me, let me just ask, can you put your hand up, please, if you were with me in Shenzhen last year? Uh, how many people were in Shenzhen last year? Okay, so may maybe about 20, okay? So some of the slides uh, may be familiar to those of you who were in Shenzhen. Uh, please be patient. We have to bring everybody in Guangzhou up to speed. Uh, you know, we know everyone in Shenzhen is smarter and uh, more intelligent than in Guangzhou, but if the people who were in Shenzhen can just be patient, just keep calm, uh, we will get everyone in Guangzhou to the same place and then we can uh, move forward. So, I'm going to first of all give you a quick uh, overview of marketing. I'm going to talk about global marketing in particular, and then we're going to talk uh, for a few minutes about customers in more detail. So, the first thing to understand about marketing, the purpose of a business, if you're an entrepreneur starting a business, the purpose of your business is to create and keep a customer. Okay? Create and keep a customer. That is what your purpose is as an entrepreneur. You may think your purpose is to make a lot of money. Uh, you may think your purpose is to uh, run a big company. Uh, but all of that is irrelevant and it will not happen unless you can create and keep a customer. So what is marketing? First of all, it's to develop very powerful customer insights that respond to both explicit and latent consumer needs. When I say explicit needs, I mean you go and do some market research, the consumer will tell you what they want. But the consumer can't tell you they want that. No market research can tell you they want that. And, you know, Steve Jobs famously said, the customer's job is not to know what they want. Okay? My job is to imagine on behalf of the customer what the future should look like and then to give it to them in a way that they can understand and be excited by it. Okay? So that's, what, that's where the latent customer insights come in. Steve Jobs had fantastic ability to understand the latent needs of the customer, what the customer would respond to if they were given the chance to see it. But if you just rely on asking the customer what do they want, then you will just be, you know, doing the same old thing that everybody has been doing for ever. No real disruptive innovation will come from that. So number one is developing these powerful insights. Second is uh, launching competitively superior products or services, or services that leverage these insights. Third is creating value by branding them, distributing them, 
and communicating with customers about them. And fourth is extracting value by pricing these products and services profitably. Okay? So all of everything you need to know about the scope and meaning of marketing is on this slide. Okay? So remember I mentioned in the last session the uh, company Oppo. So let, let's just think about Oppo again. The founder, the head of Oppo, he has the insight that consumers in third and fourth tier cities don't want to buy smartphone online. They want to touch and feel in the store before they put the money down. So he changed the distribution approach for third and fourth tier cities. That's a consumer insight that then drives his ability to deliver distribution, distribution that acts as a competitive advantage over Xiaomi in those cities. So here some chart that lays out the principles I just mentioned, but maybe with some Chinese brand names. Okay. So broadly speaking, there are two ways in which you can go to the market. You can either go to the market through a premium price strategy, or you go to the market through a low cost strategy. You know, that, that is premium. Samsung, iPhone, premium. Oppo, Vivo, low cost. Okay? Two equally relevant strategies, but relevant to different market segments. Now, down the bottom, what I'm saying here is branding, product, distribution, pricing, communications. Five key elements of marketing strategy. To be successful, you do not have to be the best at everything. But you do have to be the best at one thing. The rest of your strategy can be good enough, but on something you have to be excellent. So, you know, Lenovo, pretty good on branding. For example, internationally after they take over the IBM PC business, you know, pretty good branding strategy around the world, how to use the IBM name, how to use the Lenovo name. Huawei, excellent uh, product innovation leadership, okay? Tencent, WeChat, fantastic uh, communications uh, platform. Uh, Alibaba, Alipay, you know, very, very good uh, on pricing. And Anchor, pretty good on distribution. So different, different companies, different brands have different core competencies. You don't have to be excellent at everything, but you have to be excellent at something. And you have to then target those consumers who value what you are excellent at. Okay, there's no point in being excellent at distribution and then targeting a group of consumers who don't care about your distribution. Companies have to be customer driven. So here are, here are three quotes from three companies. Just read these quotes. The first is from the founder of very famous Japanese company, Matsushita. So, Mr. Matsushita says this 
he says these words 40 years ago. We are not... Re we are responsible for products until they are disposed of by the final consumer. Not until we sell them, not until the warranty runs out, not until they are sold to someone else, but until they are disposed of by the final consumer. That is a very environmentally responsible statement. And that is 40 years old. Now I hear, I read in the paper, you know, some government ministers in Beijing, they say, oh, you know, we have to improve uh, environmental responsibility of business. You know, Mr. Matsushita could have told uh, those government officials that he could have told them that 40 years ago. But China pursuing economic growth has allowed a lot of companies to do a lot of uh, irresponsible things in terms of environmental degradation. They make the trade-off, but eventually China has to pay to clean up the environment. So this is a very customer-oriented philosophy because it's looking at society responsibility, not just at making money for the shareholder. Then the second, the second quote, this is from the founder of Federal Express. You know Federal Express, FedEx, very important uh, package delivery company. So notice that service is all actions and reactions that customers perceive they have purchased. Perceive. Very important to understand when you are in marketing, the customer's perception is what counts. It doesn't matter what the reality is. What counts is the customer's perception of what you have given them in terms of service. And then, well, the third one from my own experience. I have a problem with my car. Uh, someone hits my car, uh, gets a big dent in the, in the side. So I take it to uh, a what we call auto body shop, you know, for repairing the car. And when I walk in to this place, not so nice a place, I walk in and behind the counter, big American guy. Many tattoos, many tattoos, okay? I'm scared, okay? And then behind him, behind him, he has notice on the wall. And on the wall it says, we screw the other guy and pass the savings on to you. So then, then I ask him, I ask him, am I the other guy? <laughs> okay. I don't feel so comfortable as a consumer when I see this notice. Okay? So, you know, you have to be sensitive if you're going to be successful. You have to be sensitive. What is the consumer or the customer going to think about the way you are treating them? You know, are you treating the customer with respect? When you are doing your customer analysis as an entrepreneur, what do you have to focus on? Number one is, who, who is the customer? Who is the customer? You know, it's not so obvious because everything that you purchase, there's someone else influencing you. You know, it's not just you. You may be paying the money, but maybe your child is playing with the toy. Maybe your child is the user, and you are the purchaser. Uh, maybe you take your child to the store to see the toys, and the child decides which one. Or maybe you go online and you see some reviews of various toys, and from those reviews, you, you are helped in your decision. My point is that you have to think who is influencing, who is 
going to decide who is going to purchase and who is going to use. Influencer, purchaser, user, decider. Four different categories. Even for a simple purchase, there will be more than one person involved in that decision. Very, very few consumer decisions are taken unilaterally without the input of others. And so that then leads you to think, well, what is the process by which the consumer makes a decision? And how can I influence that process as a marketer? What can I do to touch the consumer in their decision-making journey so that I can influence the decision towards my brand or my product? So that then means you have to look at what does the consumer need in terms of information? What do they need in terms of product attributes? What pre-sales service and after-sales service do they need? Are they looking to just have a transaction? Uh, or are they looking to have a deep experience? Are they, having, are they looking for just a relation? Are they looking for more than a transaction? They may be looking for a long-term relationship with my brand or with my business, my company. So you have to understand what different groups of consumers are looking for and then decide what are you going to deliver. And the decision-making process is all about the sequential journey along which the consumer travels before making that decision. That's the decision-making process. A way of thinking about it very quickly is, where does the consumer buy? When do they buy? How often do they buy? And how can we touch the consumer as the marketer? How can we influence the consumer through social media, through word-of-mouth recommendations, through advertising, through salespeople? How can we influence the consumer before they make the purchase decision? That's, that's why it's so important to do the deep customer analysis. Now, not every consumer wants to have a deep relationship with your brand. You know, if you think about, think about it for a moment, how many brands do you have that you want that you feel I have a deep relationship with this brand? Okay, any? Maybe someone might say, "Well, okay, I think uh, I love my BMW." Okay, so they might have a relationship with BMW, or someone might say, "You know, I love uh, Apple iPhone." You know, so they, they feel very positive and have a relationship in their mind with their iPhone. But, you know, how many brands can you have that kind of relationship with? So a lot of, a lot of marketing l commentators talk about, oh, you have to build a relationship with the consumer, and you have to get close to the consumer, and so on. And a lot of marketing money is wasted trying to persuade consumers to get close to your brand when, you know, most consumers don't have the time and don't care about it. Okay, let's say you're Procter and Gamble and you're selling Tide detergent. You know, does the consumer want an intimate relationship with their detergent? I don't think so. You know, they want a good quality detergent that cleans their clothes efficiently at a good price and forget about everything else. So, don't try and build relationships where customers don't want to build them, uh, where the customer won't pay for all of the effort that you're putting into trying to build a relationship. Okay? 
Um, and then don't try to build relationships with customers in the wrong way. You have to, you have to ask permission uh, in order to use the customer's information uh, to sell to them, right? We all know this privacy issue, the data privacy issue. Um, most consumers now, they don't want to be taken advantage of and have their personal data used uh, by marketers without their permission. So if you're trying to be clever and market to me uh, without uh, my having given you permission to do that, you know, I'm going to punish you if I find out. I'm going to reject the brand rather than be positive towards it. So you have to be very careful. Um, now, not all customers are created equal as I've already implied. And this is one chart that's a good chart to sort of summarize one way of segmenting most markets, right? So in most cases, you know, there are some customers who will pay a high price for a product, but they'll want a lot of service when they pay the high price. Other customers will pay a low price, and they won't want as much service. So let's say you are, you are going to a hotel in Beijing. If your company uh, is paying, if you're from a state-owned company, maybe you go to a very good hotel, but you pay a high price, but you expect good service. But if you're a young entrepreneur with not so much money, you go to uh, seven days in, and you pay uh, a low price. You don't expect such great service if you pay the low price. Both, both of these hotels can be profitable and make money, but they are targeting two different segments of uh, consumers, right? One is in the bottom left, and one is in the uh, top right. Now, one interesting thing on the chart is that if you look at your own customers, I'm talking here to the big companies in the room, not so much the startup companies, but if you look at the big companies, if you take all of the customers that you have, that you are serving, you can put them on this chart because some customers are paying a high price and not asking for so much service, that's these in the top left, right? They pay a high price, but they don't expect so much service. These actually are very profitable customers, very profitable. Customers that are unprofitable are the, these customers here. You cannot make money from these customers. They want a lot of service from you, but they're not prepared to pay a high price. So in most cases, if these customers are small, small customers, you get rid of them, you know, because you, ju you just say, look, you know, please take your business somewhere else because, you know, we, we, we would love to do business with you, but we, we cannot make any money with you. But... The problem is that many of those companies in the bottom right, many of the customers in the bottom right, they are actually very big accounts. In business-to-business -business marketing, some of your biggest customers are going to be in the bottom right. You can't get rid of them so easily because if you, if you get rid of them, that might be 5 10% of your sales one customer, and then you have all of your overhead costs have to then be paid for by the customers who represent the remaining 90% of sales. So getting rid of the customers in the bottom right, not so easy. Most people think, oh, I don't have this problem. But actually, every company has a distribution of customers 
across this entire chart. And if, if I were to draw a uh, diagonal through the chart like that, the customers who are above the diagonal, those are my profitable customers. Customers below the diagonal are my unprofitable customers. So most, most companies do not know the comparative profitability of their customers. I bet you if I said to you, those of you who are in business-to-business -business marketing, if I said to you, come to me tomorrow with this chart, put an X for every one of your top 100 customers where they are on this chart. Most of you would not be able to do that. Most of you would not know the profitability of each of those top 100 customers to be able to plot on the chart. Well, how can you, how can you manage your customers effectively for profitability if you don't know which are profitable and which are not profitable? You know, as I said, some customers, you know, they look like they're profitable, but actually they're asking for so much service all the time. You know, the actual realized profit margin is probably much lower, right? Much lower. So I would say customer segmentation, very important. Let's have a look at what does customer segmentation mean? So a segment, it's a group of customers with uh, similar characteristics, attitudes or needs, or usage behavior who will respond more profitably to a tailored marketing program. Okay? A tailored marketing program. What, 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 what does this mean? If I tell you, okay, you have to do segmentation. Segmentation only makes sense if you are changing the marketing program to meet the needs or the differences of a particular segment, right? But if I change the marketing program to adapt to a particular segment, then it's going to cost more money. Administratively, it's going to cost more money to target each segment separately. So I have to extract a higher profit to cover the extra cost of the segmentation investment. Okay? So the, the art of segmentation is to decide which one or two approaches to segmenting the market really make the most sense for that product category and for my strategy at this current time. There are hundreds of approaches to segmenting the market, right? Yes, demographics, age, income, dis education, or attitudes, usage behavior, geography, many, many different ways to segment the market. But I can't, I can't end up with, I can't end up with 1,000 segments. I can't do 1,000 marketing plans for 1,000 segments. I have to choose, you know, which one, which one or two segmentation approaches really make sense for my strategy at this point in the development of this product category. If you are, how many people here have written a marketing plan? Hands up, if you, have you written a marketing plan? Okay. In the marketing plan, one of the big features is you have to say, who is your target customer, right? Who is the customer? How many of you in your marketing plan said, who is not our customer? 
how many of you explicitly say who is not your customer? Okay, who are you not going to serve? Okay, half the people keep their hands down. So what you have to do is really focus in on the people who are your core customers. Uh, you have to understand that you cannot serve everybody. You cannot be all things to all people, right? You have to choose who to serve. And the, the customers that you choose really effect, define the strategy. It define the company that you become. You know, when Oppo choose tier three, tier four cities, that defines who Oppo is as a company. So your customer selection is really absolutely the most critical element to your entire strategic marketing program. Now one thing to watch out for is what we call the heavy user segment, okay? It goes back to what I said before. Everybody looking at uh, economic growth in the East Coast cities, you know, they're all focusing on tier one cities, all chasing the same people, and, you know, instead leaving out the tier three, tier four. But here's why it also does not make sense to always chase after the heavy user. The more experience you have, the better you are at understanding and evaluating the different alternatives in a category independent of brand. You can look at the price, you look at the performance, and you can make the trade-off, is this price too high for that level of performance, or is it low relative to that level of performance, so it's actually a good value. The more you know about a business, the more you know about a product category, the more able you are to make these evaluations without having to rely on the assurance of a brand name. So in, in B2B marketing, in B2B marketing, the heavy user is the smartest customer and the smartest customer will pay the lowest price for the highest value. So if you're all chasing the heavy user, you're actually chasing people who are not going to pay a premium for the product. The people, who, the people who pay the premium for the product are the people who are smart enough to know that there are significant differences between one product and another, but they're not smart enough to be able to evaluate for themselves what those differences are. And those are the people who will pay a premium for a trusted brand. They will pay a premium for a trusted brand the people in the middle. The heavy user, not going to pay the price premium. Also, the very low light user, light user. Ah, the product is not really so important for that person, so they just take uh, a low price. They don't worry so much. It's the people in the middle who really pay the premium for the, uh, the brand name. So oft often when you're in B2B marketing and you look at your segments of customers according to price paid and service delivered, you know, the guys who are the most profitable are not the big customers but the middle-sized customers who are paying you a good price but not demanding so much service. So you're, you're making good money from them. 
Do you see what I'm saying? If everybody chased the same consumer, you end up all killing each other. Make no money. So don't be falling into the trap of just following or pursuing heavy users. Now, as you will know if you are studying marketing, a very important concept in marketing is the product positioning, the positioning strategy for the brand or for the product for the company. So to develop your positioning strategy, you have to do two things. You have to uh, analyze the customer segments, and you have to do the product differentiation. OK? So one way of remembering this is P equals S plus D. Positioning equals segmentation plus differentiation. So what, what do we need to have a very good positioning for our brand? We have to uh, do three things. We have to, number one, we have to say this is the target market. Number two, we have to say this is why we are superior to competitors in serving the target market. And number three, we have to say this is the reason why we are superior. Okay? So here, here's an example. You all know the Avis rent-a-car, right? So if you look at the positioning statement, First of all, they say, we, we are targeting business customers. They're not tr targeting tourists or uh, leisure customers. They're targeting business customers. And they're saying, Avis is the company that will give you the best service. So the, the superiority claim Avis is making is best service. That is the superiority claim. But then the most important thing is the reason why. Why should someone in the target audience believe the superiority claim? Well, they say, because our employees own the company. In the case of Avis, it's an employee-owned company. And therefore, they're saying, OK, our employees own the company, so they're going to try and deliver really great service, make you happy, uh, so you come back. They will make uh, more money if the company does well. So think about it. Your own company in the marketplace, are you giving your customer a convincing reason why they should believe your superiority claim? No. Most of you, is anyone, can anyone say, OK, I give my customer a convincing reason why they should believe my superiority claim over the competitors? Anyone? Three hands in the room. Three or four hands. OK? So the, the hardest part is the third part. The hardest part is the third leg of the stool, which is the reason why. Anyone can say, OK, I serve the business customer. Anyone can say, my service is superior. Convince me as the customer to believe you. That is what is difficult. That's what's difficult. You have to have a reason why I should believe you. Otherwise, why, why should I give you my business? Why should I try you instead of someone else? 
So you have to work on this. This is so important, so important. Okay? They go back to uh, Trump again. You know, what's the reason why? Well, I am a billionaire. So, number one, I show you I'm already very competent because, you know, I've become a billionaire. But secondly, because I'm a billionaire, no one can buy me. No one, no special interest, no lobby, no industry can buy me because I pay for my own campaign. I am not going to be a hostage to these uh, companies or big donors. So that, 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 that is a very convincing reason why people vote for the reason why, okay? All right, so here, here's another chart. I think you will find this chart also uh, quite useful. So, you know, one, one big part of uh, segmentation is the so-called uh, benefit segmentation. Um, benefit segmentation means, you know, some people are looking for one thing, some people are looking for another thing. So, you know, for example, if you're flying a plane, okay, the business, business class customer wants a different set of things from the economy customer. The expectations are different, the benefits that they desire are different. Economy customer wants low price and to get from one place to the next. They don't expect a lot of service. Business customer pay higher price, and they expect a lot of service benefits in return for the higher price. Okay. So what, what are we saying here on this chart? If you, if you think about all of the benefits that you could market to your customers, for the segment that you are going after, some of these benefits are very important and some of them not so important. But the second part of it is the perceived differentiation among the competitive brands in delivering these services, right? So if you think about the airline again, airline, choice of an airline, okay? You, traveling as a business person, you have the benefits that you think are really important that you want to get. It could be the efficiency or regularity of the flights, on-time performance, comfort of the seat, quality of the food, are the flight attendants uh, providing good service? Any of these could be more important to one person versus another. But equally significant is how do you perceive the various brands to uh, be different? So on the benefits that you think are important, you know, do you think Air China is better than China Southern or China Eastern or Hainan? You know, which one is better? Which one do you perceive to be better in delivering the benefits that you really value as being the most important? And that, that is where you want to compete as a supplier. So you want to find out as a marketer for the customers that I am serving, you know, what are the benefits that they think are really important and how do they perceive me, my brand, versus all the other competitive brands in the delivery of these benefits. So that means that if you look at this chart, the benefits that you want to be superior on are these benefits here, right? Because for your, for your target customer, these are very important. And also, you perceive a lot of differentiation among the brands on these benefits. Okay? 
you don't want to be wasting time being superior on these benefits. This is a complete waste of time to worry about these, right? And ev even these benefits here, you know, may maybe maybe the the color, maybe the color options of a car fall into this category. Okay, it would be nice to have the color that you really like, but you know, how important is the color options when you're choosing a new car? You know, it's a fringe issue. Yes, you can see differences between one brand and another, but it's not so important, right? Now, down here, you have a very interesting group of benefits here. So we call these the uh, defensive benefits. Very important, but not perceived to be so much difference between the brands. Okay. So a, ver a very good example of a defensive benefit would be safety. Safety when you are choosing an airline. Okay? If I ask you, is safety important? Everybody says, yes, very important. But if I ask you, okay, between Air China, China Southern, China Eastern, any difference in safety? Well, I can no, no difference. So therefore, not really Imp not really significant in driving the choice. All of the competitors are basically similar. Okay? But that, yeah, and also, by the way, no one is going to advertise, you know, Air China not going to run an advertising campaign saying, oh, please fly Air China. We have only one accident in the last five years, China Southern has three. Okay? No, no one going to run an advertisement like that, right? Because every, every competitor, every airline understands you don't advertise something that could be a problem, that could dissuade consumers from even flying in the first place. That would be stupid. But there's one Chinese company, well, it's actually Swedish, but China now owns the company, that has done a fantastic job of taking safety and moving safety from being a defensive benefit into being a jugular benefit. Does any, anyone know which company I am talking about? Volvo, thank you. Geely, Geely. So, maybe 25 years ago, Volvo, they have a great customer insight. The great customer insight is that for middle class, families. Mother, mother, take children to school each day in car and bring home from school to uh, at the end of each day. Precious cargo, very precious cargo, need safety. Safety jugular benefit for this segment. And Volvo have this consumer insight 25, 30 years ago, and they keep with it now all of these years. And, um, you know, the uh, Chinese ownership understands that. So, you know, now what uh, Volvo has uh, publicly stated, publicly stated in 2020, by 2020, so four, three years, right? No one will be killed in a Volvo anywhere in the world. 
Okay, no one will die in a Volvo. Can can you imagine? Can you imagine this uh, claim? So every lawyer in America is lining up, waiting to make a lot of money by suing Volvo. Okay, but Volvo have the courage, the courage to make this great public statement. And, you know, we will see. Maybe, maybe, maybe there will be a problem. But I think, you know, when you make a big public uh, statement like this, all of your engineers for the next three years, they are working like uh, dogs to try and make sure they build the car that is totally safe from any risk of death to the uh, driver or the passenger. So, in this way, for the rest of the car industry, safety is not really a jugular claim. But for Volvo, there's a special segment of the market that really values that benefit. And they're willing to pay a premium for a Volvo that will deliver that benefit. So, it's a very powerful uh, example in relation to this uh, chart. So what, what happens when you, you put the, the various slides together? Okay. This is what uh, marketing is about. You do your customer analysis. You do your segmentation of the customer. You select your target market. Okay, that is S segmentation. Down here on the bottom, you look at the product analysis of the competitors. Look at the, all the products of the competitors. And then you do your differentiation strategy. How are we going to be different from our competitors? And that then results in you developing product that focuses on a few jugular benefits, you know, the very most important benefits uh, from your point of view. So that's the S uh, plus the D, and then you put that together and you have the positioning. The positioning of the brand in the uh, competitive marketplace. And then, if you get your positioning really good, really good positioning, then the positioning drives all of the detailed decisions that you make on these other elements of the marketing strategy. The brand, the product policy, communications policy, pricing policy, distribution policy. Okay? So let, let's just take a look at um, each of these. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the key issues associated with each of these particular elements of the marketing strategy. So let's, let's just start with brand and product policy. Every brand has to build its brand meaning from the customer point of view. And usually, that involves talking about the functional benefits of the brand, but then also the emotional benefits of the brand as well. So, you know, let, let's just take, uh, because I happen to um, have the, uh, the coffee here, okay? So we have the uh, Starbucks, right? So, you know, most people would say, well, you know, the coffee is okay, but I'm not sure that it's the, act, the best coffee. From a functional point of view, is Starbucks the best coffee? Mm, some people say yes, some people say no. But what about the emotional experience associated with going to and being part of this brand? Well, then a lot more people start becoming very positive and saying, you know, this is a very different brand because the total experience that I have when I go to 
uh, a Starbucks, it makes me feel really good. Uh, and maybe in the Starbucks I am socializing with my friends or I am, you know, conducting business in a safe and comfortable environment. So my point is the brand meaning is not just the functional performance, uh, it's also the emotional element of the brand as well. Uh, actually, a brand is a club. A brand is a club that's owned by its customers. Um, you know, we are all wearing uh, this uh, logo, right? You know, today we are all members of this club. So this, this is a brand that actually is a club. You know, it's why the, some of the most powerful brands in the world are actually sports clubs. Real Madrid, Barcelona, okay, Manchester United. You know, these are very powerful global brands because they are clubs. And a club is basically owned by the members. Okay, when I ask people, well, I think you have a, a very nice company, who owns the brand that you are selling? If I say, who owns the brand you are selling? You know, half the people say, well, I own the brand. It's my brand. Or they might say, well, the shareholders own the brand. Ah, the brand is owned by the customer. Without the customer owning the brand, you don't have anything. You know, it goes back to my original point, the purpose of marketing is to create and keep a customer. Okay? One of the most important questions you can ask in marketing is the fourth bullet point. So mo most people go out and they ask, what do you think of my brand? Oh, I think it's pretty good. I think it's not so good. But they never ask, what do you think my brand thinks of you? Actually, that's a much more important question to ask because the consumer wants to feel the respect and they want you to understand them. They want you to listen to them. They want you to respect them. If you, if you think the consumer is stupid, you do not deserve to sell anything to a consumer. But, you know, many people in marketing I, I meet, you know, they think, oh, you know, the consumer, the customer is so dumb they don't understand how brilliant my product is. Okay? Well, that, that is a very negative and unsuccessful way to try to do business. You have to be uh, humble and respectful of the customer uh, in order to get the customer to listen to your argument as to why they should give their money to you. Um, so when, when we think about uh, Starbucks, um, I can go back uh, 25 years to when uh, Howard Schultz first started Starbucks. And his statement was, we want Starbucks to be the third place in your life. The third place in your life. So wh 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 what, you, what is the first place in your life? Home. Home, family, relatives, loved ones. What is the second place in your life? Work, right? Office, colleagues. Okay? So here, here is a guy, he has maybe three coffee shops, three coffee shops, 
and he comes out in America and says, I want Starbucks to be the third place in your life. So, well, if he was in Europe, if he was in Europe and he came out and said that publicly, they would send an ambulance. They would send an ambulance and some guys in long white coats to take him away uh, to the insane asylum. Because in Europe, you know, one of the problems in Europe is they're not, not entrepreneurial enough in Europe. You know, you, you, can't, you can't make some arrogant, ambitious statement like uh, this statement. I mean, first of all, what about the church or the temple? You know, isn't that the third place? You know, uh, what about the opera house? Maybe the concert hall? You know, maybe that's the fourth. I mean, for a coffee shop is going to be the third place in your life? Please, remove this man. That's what they say in Europe. But in America, you make some crazy idea like this, and, you know, 330 million people, you can always find 100 people who are crazy to sign up for the idea, right? So this is why um, United States and China, very similar, very similar personalities, okay? We have a lot of entrepreneurs in China, want to make a difference, competing hard, working hard, uh, same as in the United States. So two, two very good uh, cultures for entrepreneurship. But I think in China, in China still you can do better. Because, you know, in China, there's a very famous saying, you have to stand, you want to stand out, but you have to fit in. Right? You want to stand out, but you have to fit in. So, in China still today, mm, maybe still too much fitting in and not enough standing out. In America, maybe a different problem. Too much standing out, not enough fitting in. Okay? So, you know, we have something to learn from each other. But my, my point is that you have to have the, the, the courage to give um, a big vision for your business. You have to put your neck out and give a big vision. Okay? I once, I once saw an English company. They make uh, pies, you know, food products, pies. And in uh, England, there is a particular type of pie um, made from some not-so-good meat and so on, and they call it a humble pie. Humble pie. Okay? So, I am in England. I see a van a truck from this company going down the street and on the side of the van it says Humble Pie Company. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Then I look at, there is a slogan, the slogan underneath the, uh, the name of the brand. So the slogan is, our pies aren't bad. Okay? Not our pies are the best in the world, but because we are the humble pie company, our pies aren't bad. Okay? There's a very European style. Understate, understate the claim. The problem is no one get excited. Okay? No one get excited by this claim. So you have to have the big idea, the big vision. Um, but then, of course, you have to follow through. You know, you cannot uh, make the big statement and then uh, um, do nothing. So 30 years later, he has 30,000 or 20, sorry, 20,000 uh, stores worldwide. But he make this statement when he only has three. Very good. 
So it's not just about uh, the product functionality. It's not just about the coffee. It's about the services that you get in the Starbucks. It's about the processes that the baristas are taught to go through to deliver your total experience. When you, when you come into a Starbucks, what is the first thing that hits you when you come in? What's the first thing when you come in? Shout it out. The smell, she says. Actually, it's not correct. It's not correct. Because, you know, when, when, you, when you are paying $3 or $4 for a cup of coffee. We don't call that smell. We call it something else. What do we call it in English? We call it aroma. Aroma. Okay? When you go to, uh, how many of you been to Dunkin' Donuts? Anyone been to Dunkin' Donuts? You know, it's uh, not so good, right? Not as good as Starbucks. When you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you pay $1, you get smell. When you go to Starbucks, you pay $3, that's aroma, okay? That's a higher level, whole higher level of experience than smell. My point is, you have to be able to articulate and deliver a total brand experience when you're charging three dollars. A second key issue in branding is the uh, individual brands versus the corporate umbrella brands. So any, anyone here worked for uh, Procter & Gamble? Anyone from Procter & Gamble or used to work at Procter? Okay, one person, right. So you will know from Procter & Gamble Many different individual brands, right? Not one Procter & Gamble brand over everything. Much less efficient in the global economy to have all of these different brands. So you look at Samsung or Hire, everything they make is Samsung. Refrigerators, TVs, smartphones, everything is Samsung. One brand for everything. Umbrella brand. Umbrella brand. Procter & Gamble, individual brands. Very expensive to build up each name. Pampers, Tide, Head & Shoulders, Pantene, Everything costs money to build new brand here, new brand there. Very inefficient now. So one advice I always give a startup entrepreneur, everything you do, you do under one brand name. Don't waste time listening to consultants or reading papers or books telling you you have to have different brands all over the place. It's a waste of money. Just make the branding very simple. One brand, that's all you need. So if you have the one brand, then the issue is over how many price points vertically can you stretch the one brand? And then over how many different products horizontally can you stretch the brand? Okay, so you can go from refrigerators to the smartphones, right? All of these are electronic products. Consumers understand they are pretty similar. You know, they're under the category of consumer electronics and appliances. But, you know, what if Samsung start making uh, clothing? Samsung fashion or Samsung sunglasses? Well, you know, then you start thinking maybe the brand not the brand meaning not so relevant to sunglasses and fashion apparel. So you're stretching the brand horizontally over too many product categories. 
okay? So this is a big issue in branding. And when, when the problem is that when people are under short-term pressure to deliver more sales and more profit, they start thinking irresponsibly about stretching the brand over too many different products. You don't want to do that. Okay. Last point on this slide. If you have several products in your product portfolio, you have to be able to ask any salesperson in one sentence, why does that brand exist? Why does that product exist in my portfolio of products? What is the strategic, strategic rationale for that product? in my portfolio. And the salesperson has to be able to answer that in one sentence because if the salesperson can't get it, the salesperson won't be able to communicate it quickly and forcefully to the customer. So then why will the customer buy it? So this is what I call the uh, salesman test can your salesman in one sentence express the strategic rationale for each product in the product line? Okay? Most companies over time, they just add more and more products. In the end, they have so many products, no one knows anymore why the heck many of these products exist. You know, it's funny, in a big company, you're going to get promoted for launching a new product. No one ever gets promoted for deleting a product, for getting rid of a product. But often, you know, you make more money for your company if you're getting rid of something and getting it out of the product line to make the product line more streamlined, more responsive to current customer needs, instead of just letting the product line grow, grow, bigger, bigger, broader, deeper, and it just becomes a complete mess. Nobody can understand it. This is why... This is why so many people leave big companies to set up their own small business because they just cannot stand the bureaucracy and the stupidity of the big company anymore. Okay, I'm sure some of you here have had this experience. Okay, what about number two? We have talked about branding and product. Now let's talk a little bit about communications, okay? So there are uh, six elements to the marketing communication strategy. Very simple. We call them the six M's. Six M's of communication. You start with the target market over here. Once you, once you specify the target market, what is the next thing in a communication strategy? What are you going to say to the target market? What are the messages, the messages that you want to communicate to the target market? Thirdly, what media, either traditional media or digital media, online, social media, what media mix is the best to get this message to the target market? Okay? For so, some target markets, traditional advertising may still work. For many target markets, you need the new social media. Okay, how, how much is all of this effort going to cost? What is our communications budget? How much money? And then, very important, what are the measures, the metrics that we are going to use in order to measure the effectiveness with which we spend the money. So this is what we call the six M's, 
of communications. Motives, what are our objectives, markets, messages, media, measures. Okay? Very simple. Every communications plan should have coverage of these six issues. Every communications plan. If you are hiring, if you're hiring an advertising agency, if you're hiring a public relations firm, and you do not have a plan covering these six things, you don't pay. Don't pay the agency, okay? Because you're not getting uh, what you need. So I say, you know, digital media come on very, very strong. You know, China, obviously, number one, way ahead of US. Maybe the only country ahead of China in digital media uh, would be uh, Korea. Korea also very, very strong in uh, digital media. So why, why is uh, digital media so, so important these days? Well, interestingly, a lot of people don't trust the business so much. You know, maybe they trust the government, but not so much business. So the word of mouth recommendation, word of mouth recommendation uh, becomes very important in driving consumer decisions. And of course, the social media is an excellent way of enabling me as a consumer to get recommendations from people I don't know, but if I go on third-party third party websites um, that uh, accumulate, you know, restaurant reviews or hotel reviews, then I can get the wisdom of the crowd. The wisdom of the crowd becomes available to me. Now, when you have an economic slowdown, actually the social media also becomes more important because when everything is going well, everybody has a good job, they, have, uh, they are making money, uh, but when things start slowing down, you need help. That's when you need help from your network, your network of friends and acquaintances and friends of friends, all of that becomes important when you need help. And when there's a slowdown, you need more help. So that's also interesting that social media, they, they don't follow the usual trend of when there's an economic downturn, the social media slows down. No, the social media actually picks up even more. Um, the third key thing that's important is now the advertisers, the people who are spending the money, the big, big companies, they are now allocating their media money proportionately, proportionately to where the consumer is spending their viewing time, right? So more and more of your viewing time is spent looking at your smartphone and probably looking at uh, video video on the smartphone. So the question is, put it for example, if 25% of your viewing time for screens, I'm talking about screen viewing time, 25% is spent looking at videos on this. If you are an advertiser like Procter & Gamble or uh, um, you know, Unilever or one of the very big companies, do you allocate 25% of your media budget to advertise around the videos on the smartphone? Or are you still spending too much on the old-fashioned advertising? So more and more now we are seeing the big, big marketing companies, the automobile companies, the um, food companies, the L'Oreal and other health uh, and cosmetic companies, they're spending more and more money now 
where they should on the digital media. So that is further fueling uh, the growth of digital media. There's one, one other thing that's very important in uh, the digital media. And that is that actually in order to be a successful brand on digital, you really need to be a social brand. Because, you know, WeChat, all of these things, that's all about social interaction, right? The digital media experience that you are engaged with, you know, when you are on your smartphone, most of the time it's interacting with someone else via digital, right? And when that's the case, th that's a very social activity. So for a brand to be successful in social media, the brand has to be social, okay? So w one reason why Starbucks is so successful is because the brand meaning is all about social experience that you get in the Starbucks. Even if you go on your own, you are interacting with the barista, you are maybe talking to other people in line in the store because you are all part of the same brand club. It's a social brand. And actually, Coca-Cola has done a fantastic job of also creating a social brand around Coca-Cola. But if you, if you are just a functional, boring, functional product, you know, it's not so easy to be a star on social media. So I always say to people today, if you are creating a new brand, number one recommendation is you have to make it a social brand because only that way will you be successful in social media, the new uh, digital media. So, yeah, here are just some um, um, comments on uh, data for, for Starbucks. Actually, uh, I was wrong a little bit earlier. It's 36 million Facebook fans for Starbucks. So I think I gave them a smaller number in the first uh, segment. Um, so let's just uh, remind ourselves, you know, China and digital. Um, and why so many big Western companies learning more about how to use digital from all of the innovation uh, in uh, China. Um, so I just want to I just want to ask you how many people here are in digital marketing in China? You know, how many working in digital marketing? Okay, so maybe we have, uh, I think, 30 or 40 people here. And how many, how many people here are working on apps? In other words, bringing new apps to uh, customers or consumers in the digital uh, space. Okay, I see around about uh, 15, 20 hands, right? So... All I would say is, you know, when I think about where do I look for innovation, where do I look for exciting new ideas for uh, digital, um, I'm looking to uh, only China and Korea uh, for these ideas. Um, uh, not so much for the United States because, you know, we have still many, many people who are, you know, still with, they still have the personal computers. Uh, okay, they have the smartphone, but, you know, most people in the emerging countries, um, in Africa, for example, they never have a PC. They never had a PC. They never had a landline phone. Uh, they go from the jungle to this, okay? Straight to this from the jungle. They don't know anything else. So they are willing to build all of their life around this. Uh, and so that's why you have more innovation in those countries where 
this smartphone was totally disruptive and totally changed the lives of these uh, people. All right, so before we go to lunch, I'm going to say a few more words about pricing and also distribution, okay? So on this chart, it's just a simple chart to say when you are thinking about how do you set a price? How do you set a price for your product or for your brand? Okay, well, first of all, you look at how much does it cost to make the product. We don't want to charge less than it costs to make it. So the cost of making it is what we call the uh, variable cost. This is the cost of making one incremental, one marginal additional unit of output. Okay, that's the variable cost. And then at the top here, this is the perceived value from the point of view of our target customer. How much is the target customer, not any customer, our target customer, how much are they valuing the brand? How much will they pay? And then we have here maybe the price of the competition. We have to look at the competition as well. And maybe we decide, okay, we will price it here because, you know, we're delivering more value than the competitor, but we have to give some of the value back to the consumer to motivate the consumer to switch from the competitor to us, okay? We have to motivate the consumer to switch from the competitor to us. So they may value our product very high, but they need an incentive to make the change. We have to give some of that value back. We can't charge the full value. We just charge maybe half of the difference. We keep half, they keep half. Then it's a good deal for both of us, right? Okay. So down the bottom we see customer value as one key variable, the perceived customer value. Secondly, the cost structure. Thirdly, the competitor's prices. And then fourthly, our own company strategy. Now, what do I mean by the company strategy? Well, some companies, they decide to go for the very high price strategy. So high unit margin, skim the market, not such a big volume of customers. Or you might say, I go for penetration pricing strategy, low unit margin, high volume. So that's the third bullet point. Skim strategy or penetration strategy. What we have seen in recent years is the development of the concept of free freemium. That means I come into the marketplace with a basic product that I offer for free. But if you want more, then you pay for the premium service. So this is, this is one way in which, for example, newspapers and magazines that used to be, used to be just print, now they are surviving by putting out basic news for free, but if you want more, you have to pay a subscription or you have to pay by the article. Um, and this is a very famous book. I think it's around about 10 years old now. Uh, anyone read this book here? Any, anyone read this book? Yeah, we have uh, three or four hands. Uh, very good book by Chris Anderson, one of the early books on pricing for internet and digital marketers. And what about distribution policy? Often this is the forgotten area of marketing. You know, people always love to talk about branding, they love to talk about advertising. 
you know, sometimes you have to talk about pricing. It's kind of boring, but you have to talk about pricing. But how many people get really passionate about distribution? Uh, not so many, right? Not so many people get passionate. So what, what are the five key questions you have to ask when it comes to distribution? Do you go to market through one channel or multiple channels? Do you go to market just online or just through retail, physical retail stores? Or do you go to market through both? You know, with the obvious problems that there may be pricing differences that are very difficult to control, for example, between your BRICS channels through bricks and mortar stores and your online channels? That's question one. Secondly, do you go to your end customer directly? You might use a direct sales force direct to the customer, or do you go through independent third-party distributors to get to the end customer? That's question number two. Number three, how intense is your distribution? Are you a selectively marketed product, so you go through just a few distributors, and in return for a certain exclusivity of distribution, they are going to push your product more? Or do you go through more of a mass market approach, what we call intensive distribution, through many, many outlets? You cover the market, but you're not giving much exclusivity to anyone. So the only way that the, only way that the retailer or the distributor is going to stock your product is because the consumer is coming in to ask for it. In other words, you are doing a lot of advertising to the end consumer, building up the end consumer's desire for the product. They then come into the store looking for the product. The retailer has to stock it, or else they're not delivering a good service to the consumer, right? So look, think about Coca-Cola for a moment. Think about Coca-Cola. How many, how many points of distribution do you think Coca-Cola needs in China in order to cover the Chinese market? How many points of distribution? How, ma how, how many people would say at least, at least 100,000? How many say at least 100,000? Put your hands up. Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Look around, look around. At least 100,000. Okay, who says at least a million? Take your hand down if you don't think at least a million. Who thinks 5 million? Hands down. Hands up if you say 5 million. Again, hands up. 5 million. Okay, 10 million. Anyone for 10 million? Any crazy people here for 10 million? Okay, the answer is 11 million. So the, the head of Coca-Cola says, to get to everyone in China, I need 11 million points of distribution. Okay. That is, that is like a military operation. That is like a bigger logistics operation than, you know, the Chinese army ever undertake. Okay? That is, that is intensive distribution. That is intensive distribution. So the for fourth question is, you know, in this distribution channel, who does what? 
Remember, what, what has to happen in a distribution channel? Information has to flow, right? Information has to flow to the end customer. Money has to come from the end customer to whoever is selling the product. And thirdly, the, if it's a physical product, the physical product has to be moved logistically from one manufacturer to the end consumer, right? So three things, information, flow, the money flow, and the physical product flow. So the key, the key in a distribution system is who does what? Who is going to perform what function? Sometimes you hear people say, you know, like Taobao and Alibaba, these guys, they say, okay, we are fantastic because we remove the middleman. We take the middleman out of the distribution channel. Make it very easy, direct contact to the consumer. But all of these functions still have to be performed. You can take the middleman out of the distribution system, but you can't take the functions that the middleman performed. So if you take the middleman out, someone still has to do whatever the middleman was doing. So the secret is, you know, what is the most efficient distribution system to efficiently deliver the information the customer wants, efficiently get the money back, and efficiently move the physical product? You know, and may maybe, you know, maybe some people would say in e-commerce, maybe it's the Alibaba model, Taobao model. You know, some people would say JD.com. You know, very different model. Own their own distribution outlets, right? Their own warehouses. And therefore, tight control against counterfeit products. Extra measure of uh, security and brand assurance through uh, JD.com system. But maybe cost a little bit higher. What's the trade-off? And then final question is, well, who has the power in this distribution system? You know, does the retailer have the power? You know, is it Alibaba have, has the power because they control the, they have the huge mall that all of these brands are on the mall competing. Yeah, Alibaba has a lot of power compared to the individual brands that are trying to sell through. But if you have a truly differentiated product, maybe you have power. Maybe you have the power. So for many decades, not so much today, but Intel, Intel used to have the great marketing distribution power over semiconductor production. You know, Intel, very clever company. B2B company, right? B2B. But they are one of the great consumer advertisers. They go to the consumer and they say, if your PC does not have an Intel microprocessor, and if it does not say Intel inside on your PC, then don't buy it. They create an image with the customer, the end consumer. I must have Intel inside. So then I go to the store. I only buy what says Intel inside. They are using what we call pull marketing, pull marketing to pull the demand for Intel inside product through the channel. The old B2B marketing approach would be to say, 
oh, I go to Hewlett, I go to HP, I go to IBM, I go to Dell, and I beg, beg them or give them some money, push some money to please put my Intel product in your computer. And the brand that mattered would be IBM, HP, or Dell, or Compaq, or whatever. What Intel did was change all of that. And by very cleverly, as a B2B marketer, going direct to the end consumer, pulling the demand through the channel, they essentially took control of the distribution system for uh, PCs. And actually, HP, IBM, Dell, they don't make nearly as much money as they could have made because Intel was telling the consumer every day, hey, whoever makes the box around the microprocessor, I don't care, it doesn't matter. The box doesn't matter. What matters is you have Intel chip inside the box. That's what really matters. Very clever strategy. We call that ingredient branding. Ingredient branding. But it's really about distribution control. Okay, here are a couple of uh, amusing things for you. You know, when we are moving to digital and e-commerce from the traditional retailing, a lot of companies have a problem with this. And we talk about the monkey laws of distribution. So you know the monkey in the jungle, okay? They're going from one tree to the next tree. But we all, the mother monkey always tell the child monkey, you know, don't let go of the branch you're holding on to unless you really know for sure you can get a good grip on the branch you are going to. Otherwise, you're going to fall on the floor. Okay? So, when it's a very matter, a matter of balance, you have to move to more digital distribution, but you can't let go of the business model, the old-fashioned bricks and mortar model that brought you to where you are today. But then the flip side, what is the alternative? If the termites are eating away at the tree you are on, you know, you can't stay on this tree forever. If the consumer has moved quickly to e-commerce, you can't just continue to sell through the old retail stores, you know, just because that's how you've done it before. You have to get off that tree and start some, some other approach. So when, we, when we're putting a lot of this together, okay, think about it this way. When you innovate a product, when you come out with something really new, the consumer doesn't know for sure that they should pay for your new product. You have to educate the consumer. You have to provide service. Often you have to send your own salespeople direct to the consumer to explain what the new product is and why it's superior. Often, therefore, you have to bundle the new product with service support at the beginning to get the product adoption. And you're probably, therefore, got a higher cost structure. You're going to charge a higher price, a skim price, and you're going to go through selective distribution because you need support and push from the distributors that you distribute to to help you educate the, con the customer why they should adopt the new product. But over time, as I explained about an hour ago, over time, the customer becomes more familiar with the product. They understand the product better. And by understanding the product better, they become more confident. They don't need 
education so much anymore. They don't need service support as much as they did. They're willing to try other brands. They're willing to risk paying a lower price for another brand because they're going to be able now to compare the performance of that brand with what they were using. They're going to be able to compare the, the two more confidently than they could before. So this is when you're going to move your strategy to a more intensive marketing strategy. Penetration pricing, going for volume, going for distribution rather than focusing on a high profit margin for each unit sold. So what I'm saying to you is that these markets inevitably change every day over time as customers become more expert. And you know, the only way to really, um, the only way to counter this if you are a marketer is innovation, is innovation. If you are not constantly innovating, then you are going to be, as we say, commoditized. Your product is going to become a commodity and you're only going to be able to compete on price. And so we say, well, I have, I have experienced it myself. I had uh, managers come to me and say, oh, sir, you know, we, we are having so much difficulty marketing this product, we have to lower the price. So what do I say in reply? I say, I do not need to pay you $100,000 a year to come and tell me to lower the price. I, I pay you $100,000 a year to tell me how I don't have to lower the price. You know, if all you can recommend to me is lower the price, please leave the room and I save my money. I get someone else. So this is why we always say, there are no mature products, only mature managers. Okay? You don't want mature managers telling you you have to cut price. You want people who have a passion for imagining all of the marketing things that you could do to avoid cutting price. Okay? And then the other two things we always say in America, and this is a good, uh, a good thing to end on before we go to the lunch break, right? So we always say in America, eat lunch or be lunch. Okay? Meaning, you know, you have to go out and get the customers, maybe kill your competitors, or else they're going to kill you and eat you. Okay? So um, third, if you don't have a continuous improvement philosophy, if you are not constantly embracing change, uh, you're going to die. You're going to die in business. So change or die. Some people, entrepreneurs, they come up with one good idea one good idea, and they try, they think, oh, I'm brilliant, I have the one good idea, it's so successful. Five years later, they are dead because they did not realize you have to have idea number two, then you have to have idea number three, then number four. You have to keep continuously building uh, and changing what you have uh, already achieved. Uh, if you do not embrace change, um, you are going to be in big trouble. Okay, I think it's a good time to uh, end for the morning. We pick up, uh, I think, uh, 2 o'clock, right?